Welcome to Romans Untangled, a podcast where we take a seemingly difficult book of the Bible and untangle it so that we can enjoy its beauty. Season 1, Episode 6, The Revealed Wrath of God, Romans 1, 18-32. Paul has just told us in what we have traveled so far through the book of Romans that he's really excited and not ashamed about the gospel, which means literally the good news of God. So so you'd think that as we now get into the teaching of what this gospel is, into the meat of the letter here starting in verse 18 of chapter 1, it would begin with some encouraging truths. You'd feel like I'm going to be blessed with good news. Not so much. We are now going to dive into the bad news of the book of Romans so that the good news of the gospel will seem that much greater. Hey, welcome everyone. This is Pastor Steve Treichler out of Hope Community Church in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, It's good to be with you again, and I am very, very excited about this weekend and the upcoming weeks of what we're going to be traveling through here in Romans chapter 1. Uh, If you have been with us for a while, you know that I'm trying to every week give you a Bible study tool. And so this week I want to talk about how we gonna how do you look at the whole book of Romans? In other words, just simply how do you do an outline? If if you're like me at all these days, uh, if I have something break or I forget how to even just uh, program a remote, I just go to YouTube, right? And I get the the big idea first of what's happening, and then maybe my model number is a little bit different, or maybe you know what I'm trying to do just has a little bit uh, differences, but I can kind of figure it out as long as I get the big idea. Uh, recently, I had done a YouTube just search on how do I mill lumber from logs, you know, just just flat out logs using my bandsaw, and that's just fun to learn and and uh, to grow in, and you just get a whole bunch of big ideas, but they don't have the exact model of bandsaw you have, or maybe the logs are a different species than you know they were they were talking about walnut, and I was going to use oak or or whatever. And so that's what we're going to look at this this week is for our Bible study tool is what what is the big idea here? Now, I, I just here's just sim- simple you can do this. Sure, you can get a bunch of commentaries and look at their outlines, but man, just Google it. Outline of Romans, okay? And the first thing that will come up is the Blue Letter Bible. Now, I'm going to do the Blue Letter Bible in a future um, podcast for Bible study tools because I think that's an excellent place to go. Uh, I don't use it much because I have a very fancy program called Logos, which is very good, but it's spendy. And quite honestly, um, you know, it you don't need it. Everything's online. You know, I, I this is what I do for a living, and so yes, I've invested the money, but you don't need it. I'm going to talk about that a different time. But you can get very good things from the Blue Letter Bible, which maybe you don't agree with everything that they're putting out there. Um, regarding the outlines or the way they take things, but at least it gets you a start for for what you're looking at. And they basically divide Romans into four parts, and I like this. Uh, I would I would agree with this. I put different headings on it, but I would agree with it. They would call it uh, the introduction, the first seventeen verses. They would then say there is justification by faith, uh, which is Romans one eighteen, where we're going to start today, going all the way through the end of chapter eleven. Then they would say chapter twelve to the middle of chapter fifteen is what they call the transformed life. And then from the middle of chapter 15 till the end of the book is just concluding remarks, instructions, and a benediction, all right? Now, in that, if you did Google this audio, you're looking at what I'm looking at, and they would say that that first part, what they call justification by faith, and if you don't know what that means, I'm going to get to it in just a minute, they would say there's there's four different subsections to that. There would be basically sin, the need for salvation, justification by that goes through what we're going to start today Romans 118 all the way through almost the end of chapter 3 then or excuse me about the middle verse 20 then it would be justification by faith which is 3 verse 21 all the way through chapter 4 that's the provision made for salvation then they talk about what is the what does that mean for us what's the what's the life we live then they would call it freedom the result of salvation that's chapters 5 through 8 then they would go in and call it, how does this affect the Jew and Gentile with the scope of salvation, okay? And then they would look at chapters 12 all the way to the end, and they would say, what does this transformed life look like? And they would say it goes into four categories. And I'm going to agree with those, so I'm going to give you mine, and I'll, I'll include those in mine. 
I want to give you just a simple four point. Uh, I'm going to actually add a fifth, uh, but basically, what is the big idea? In other words, as we back away in the book of Romans, how can we say this is the, the whole forest? So as I'm looking at the individual trees, I get an understanding because I know that I'm in a forest of pine trees, okay? The big ideas. Introduction. We went through that, 1, 1 to 15. I think a person should extract out the theme Verses 1, 16, and 17, because I think you just need to keep going back and back to that, because that kind of sets us free as we're looking at the rest of the book. It should all line up with the theme, which I'm going to read. I'll read this week and every week for the next few weeks, so you know that, yeah, we're, we're in line with this theme. Then I would call it simply two things, the gospel explained, um, which would be chapters starting in the middle or one eighteen, all the way through chapter 11. And then the gospel lived, chapter 12, all the way through uh, the middle of the 15. And then it's just a conclusion, a lot of, a lot of different you know, greetings and different things he's going to say to the people in Rome. So the gospel explained, the gospel lived. Okay, is that overly simple? Sure, sure, definitely, no doubt about it. I would also put four categories in, in underneath the gospel explained, but I would just call it the bad news, the good news, the freedom of being in Christ, and the storyline of Scripture regarding Jew and Gentile. How does that all work out together? Okay? And then when we get to the gospel lived, um, which is, you know, chapters 12 through middle of 15, it's just daily Christian living, being a Christian of two kingdoms. We're both in a citizen of heaven, but we're also a citizen of the the earthly, the, the, the United States, if you live here or if you're in another country. You're a citizen of that country, loving others, and then dealing with those who are weaker, and then and then obviously the conclusion. So, in just what we're going to be doing now, and we're going to be in this for a long time. Uh, I'm just saying, I, I haven't even worked out how many how many episodes the Romans Untangled will have, um, and I haven't even made it through the entire part. What I call the bad news. The bad news goes from chapter one eighteen all the way to three. Now I'm going to say verse 18. It really goes through verse 21 and and uh, or 20, excuse me. But I, I like to stop it in verse 18. I'll explain that <laughs> 43 years from now when we finally get there. Uh, no, no, no. I don't know how long this is going to be. It's going to be fun. Uh, fun. I'm just having a gas doing this. I hope you guys are too. So, uh, but we're going to be in this bad news here for a little while. Then we're going to get to the good news, and the good news is so sweet. Okay, so just to remind you, kind of where we've come, we've we've done some looking at letters and how we, you know, we need to understand both about A and B, the the recipient and the the one sending it, the circumstances and what the meaning of words are. We've looked at linking words. Remember that we looked at uh, the versions of the Bible. We talked about reading the Bible backwards in a sense. In other words, if you don't read the Bible with Christ being the answer, then you may miss it. Just like, quite frankly, the very guy who wrote this letter. The Apostle Paul, before he was a Christian, read the storyline of Scripture and rejected Jesus. And then after he came to Christ, he reread it and said, oh my gosh, I've got to read the Bible with Christ as the answer, and then it all makes sense. So with that said, uh, we've if we ventured through the first uh, 17 verses so far, uh, and I just want to remind you of the theme. I'm going to do this for the next few weeks every time, just so you know what the theme of Romans is and where we're going. For he says this, 116 and 17 says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That, that's such a blessing, right? And and we haven't talked a whole lot about it, but the word gospel literally means good news. It's a declaration of this, this excellent news, right? And you would think that the next thing he's going to do is talk about some really encouraging things. And that's not what he's going to do. He's not. We're going to dive into some of the most hard and dark and we're looking at the, the, to, uh, the totality of who God is, and we're going to look at his anger, and we're going to look at his judgment, and we're going to look at his wrath, something that is completely rejected uh, by many today. And you may be wondering, where did that come from? Where did this rejection come from? Well, it came from, uh, the, in the beginning, was a movement in the 1920s and 30s 
Uh, there was different names for it. Modernist Christianity was what some called it. Liberal Christianity, that was their own phrase and under, understanding, saying we're, 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 we're awoken to the realness of Christianity, and it's not this God of anger. It is, it is God of love, and you're reading the Bible wrong if you see anything like that. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from uh, a man by the name of Kent Hughes as he summarizes some of Hemmer, uh, Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was probably the leading voice of this movement in the 1920s and 30s. So that's 100 years ago for us, roughly. And to summarize his views, he says basically this, and I'm quoting from Kent Hughes. Quote, primitive man had a devilish concept of, of God. And so he's, he's summarizing uh, Fosdick's views. Noah's God destroyed the earth with a flood. Abraham's God was a bloodthirsty God who wanted a human sacrifice. The God of Moses was the horrible God of a volcanic fire. Speaking to him from Sinai, little by little man has advanced as the centuries rolled on. David began to have high ethical thoughts of God, but they were mixed with the terrible imprecatory psalms that call down wrath upon the enemy. Uh, just imprecatory just means they're, they're psalms where David says, I want my enemies to be crushed and broken and killed, right? Uh, to continue on, by the time of the prophets, God was really improving. He now hated unrighteousness and spoke out against the crimes committed, committed by men. And when Jesus came along, the idea of God took on the marvelous concepts of fatherhood and brotherhood, the greatest idea up to that time. But Jesus also had this repugnant, repugnant idea of hell. This, Fosdick argued, must be abandoned in order to continue the upward curve of development. Fosdick was, of course, reflecting much on the thinking of modern men at that time, where whether religious or secular, and it basically comes down to this one idea. A loving God cannot be a God of judgment or of hell. Enlightened man is progressively shedding such backward ideas. Okay, and so that goes way back to the 1920s and 30s. And it actually, if you want to do a history of, the, of what happens in American Christianity and Western Christianity in particular, you see a great divide happening at that point because what, what is known then is it moves from the, the liberal or the modernist Christian to the fundamentalist Christian. Now, that doesn't mean what it means today. Uh, it just means that they believe, actually, they do believe in a God who is wrathful, but also loving at the same time. And and some of these things called a fundamentalist. There was another divide later because the fundamentalists like to fight about everything and, and really were um, anti-intellectual on certain things. There's a movement that starts to, to uh, come out of that. It's called the evangelical movement. Again, that word, if you're pretty new to Christianity, you most of the time now uh, what we used to call fundamentalists, we would also include in, in evangelicals. That's another podcast for another whole day on the meaning of how that word has been changed. Now, that's the way things were going in Western society. When you get in Eastern or more uh, in other areas of the world, that is not the way they think. Miroslav Volv, uh, who is a Croatian, he's also the Henry B. Wright Professor of Theology and Director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at, at the Yale University. He was a witness. He grew up in Croatia. He's a witness to the violence that happened in the Balkans, just brutal violence. And he actually argues in his book, Exclusion and Embrace, that if you want to have a view of non-retaliation, in other words, if you don't want to just go and have personal revenge on what always happened, he says that's only possible when we leave vengeance to God. Let me quote from his book, uh, Exclusion and Embrace, some portions here. He says, if God were not angry at injustice and deception and did not make a final end to violence, that God would not be worthy of worship. The only means of prohibiting all recourse to violence by others is to insist that violence is legitimate only when it comes from God. My thesis that the practice of nonviolence requires a belief in divine vengeance will be unpopular with many. In the West, you hear that? He's saying, in the West, they just won't get that. But, he says, it takes the quiet of a suburban home for the birth of the thesis that human nonviolence 
results from the belief in God's refusal to judge. In a sun-scorched land, soaked in the blood of the innocent, it will invariably die with other pleasant captivities of the liberal mind. Okay, let me summarize that real briefly. He says, if you have seen what I've seen, and if you think that there's any way possible that I could not go out and want to harm or kill and cause violence for what I've seen horrible things. I've seen cities burned to the ground. I've seen children murdered. I've seen women raped. If you think that there's not something deep within me that has to be satisfied because of that, and if you think there's any way I could not respond that way without believing that someday that there is a God who will make all things right, that God is a God of justice. Now, it's interesting because we don't like the idea of a God of justice. I mean, we like the guy idea of a God of justice for everybody else, but not for us, right? But in, in, in the East, it's just the opposite. For them, it's a little bit harder for them to look at it as a God of mercy and a God of forgiveness, which, which is very interesting. With all that said, I'm bringing us now to one of the most profound chapters, uh, the end of this chapter in the book of Romans. I want to read it through with you. Uh, We're going to spend four weeks on this, this week and then three more weeks, just on this one section here. So let me read it through with you. And I'm going to read from the New New International Version this week. Here we go. Romans 1, 18 to 32. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God, excuse me, the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so they, so that they would do what ought not to be done. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now that's dark, right? I mean, that's a dark dark thing. And just just look at the very beginning here. He says in the very beginning of of the thing, after we just got reading from Romans 117, that the righteousness of God is, is revealed in the gospel. And so that's being revealed. And now, but he says, the wrath of God, and just notice this, is being revealed. So it's not a future thing that's coming. It's happening right now, and it has happened in the past. It is being revealed. It's continually being revealed, okay? So, whoa, that's an interesting take here, right? So we have to understand that Paul is not actually like changing course He is going to return to the righteousness of God, but it's not going to happen until the middle of chapter 3. So what we have to start here with is saying that what he's going to be doing now as he walks us through the bad news is he's doing this in order for us to understand the righteousness of God and so that we actually want to jump out of our chair and, and scream 
hallelujah to this, right? I mean, I, I was watching some great NCAAs right here, and I, I'm always an underdog. I don't care about my bracket. I mean, watching, uh, you know, uh, Oral Roberts University, uh, whoa, man, that was so fun to watch them knock off. We were just screaming in our in our basement here as we were watching this game. And that's what Paul wants you to do by the time you get to the middle of Romans chapter 3. Okay, so for a long time, we're going to be talking talk about the bad news. And every week, I want to remind you of the good news because I don't want to leave you hanging only with the bad news. The, the, this letter was meant to be read in a sitting, right? So in a, in, a, in a matter of, you know, probably 15, 20 minutes, you'd get into the good news when you read it. So I, I want you to hear that every time. And at the same time, we need to fully grasp the bad news, especially here in the West, because we think we're all unicorns and, and God owes us. You know, we're not like the rest of the world. We're, you know, we're, we're better. Uh, we, we, you know, we're enlightened and we're so much smarter and all these things. You know, God kind of owes us for the good we've done in the world. And it's like, um, yeah, kind of. Have you, have you watched the news lately? You know, have you, have you seen what we do to each other? So we're actually going to spend three more weeks after this week. I'm going to go through this passage and I'm going to highlight three big things. The first is which we're going to look in the beginning, verses 18 to 25, and we're going to dial in on this great exchange. There's an exchange that happens, and I think it's the best definition of sin in the Bible. I think oftentimes people misunderstand what sin is, and we're going to line this up. Then we're going to line in especially on this because I think it's really relevant for us today. And we're going to look at this idea in Romans 1, 22 to 27, where he talks about uh, sexual sin. Primarily, he leans into homosexuality. Now, what's up with that? Why would he do that? What's going on there? What's this natural for unnatural stuff? And how does that all line up? And then we're going to focus in on one verse at the very end where he talks about this, uh, that although they knew the right God's righteous decree, or in other versions, if you have another version open, it'll say the ordinance of God, right? What's that talking about? Where is, where is that going? Now, let me just, in, in the remainder of our little bit of time here left, let me just talk about a few things here that we can do kind of as an overview. The first one is the, the word wrath. Okay, so, um, and again, if you go to the Blue Letter Bible and you just Click on the word wrath. You go over to the you go over to the versions, and I'll, I'll I'll describe how to use the blue letter Bible here a little bit. But it's not you can kind of figure it out. It's pretty simple. You can look up the original Greek word. The word is orge, uh, o r g, and then and it would be a. Uh, so orge, it's it's but but what it means uh, quite literally is it means white, hot, unfiltered justice. Okay. In other words, it means that um, it, 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 it really dials into the idea of there has been a crime and there will be punishment for that crime. Now, the crime that has been committed is a large one. And if, if you look here at Romans 1, the, the, what is the crime is ultimately against God. So let me give you an example. If you came over to my house and uh, you were to say something that offended me and uh, I were to slap you, uh, you might say, I didn't like that. And you might file a, a, a case with the with the police and the police might come over and they might give me a, an assault charge, maybe. Um, they're very busy with other things, so it might not be a big deal. Let's just say that the mayor of, of, of Minneapolis... Uh, um, uh, Mr. Fry came over and it, I had dinner with him and I slapped him. Same action, but I slapped him. Well, I'm, I, you know, that probably would make news uh, and I'm sure those charges would stick and I would be in trouble. Let's just say that President Joseph Biden came to my house, all the Secret Service then. He came in <laughs> and I slapped him. I would be laying on the ground with the business end of, you know, some uh, uh, Secret Service weapons pointed at my head. I would be taken away. I would be put in the back of uh, one of those black SUVs, and uh, it would be a big deal. Now let's up the ante one more time. What if it's Almighty God? What if my sin against him is a slap in the face for him? 
So we've got to understand that as the as the importance and as the 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 power of the individual goes up, so does the need and cry out for justice. So think about that. And so what the wrath of God here, it is full out. It is wrath of God is it's an infinite crime against an infinite God. Therefore, this is a extreme wrath, not something to just, and, and, you know, and, and if you don't want to read your Bible that way, you don't like it. Um, you're, you, I, I just, I, I need to say this and it's hard to hear, but I'm sorry. It's in the Bible. I mean, this is just who God is. And that that's not all he is. Okay, so I'm going to give you the good news, even though we're not there in the passage. Paul wants you to dive into the bad news. But the, the beautiful thing is he's going to say, guess what? The righteousness of God, the justice of God, the, the way that you can be made right with God has been made known. It's through Jesus Christ. The cross becomes unbelievably beautiful when you see that we've slapped a holy God in the face. Now, we move on to a different topic here. It's probably one of the most difficult things in the book of Romans, and that is trying to understand, who are you talking about, Paul? He often uses the word they or them, and who's the they or the them or the, even sometimes even says the word I, and does he mean Paul or does he mean, what is he talking about? The, if you notice here in this passage, especially when we read forward, we'll get there in a few weeks, that the the idea of of do they know scripture do they are they part of the jewish people it probably not here this is just referring to all of humanity all of humanity especially those who don't know anything about scripture this is just general population people throughout human history one other thing we see here as i move on from that idea is that uh this passage right here clearly states a refutation to the idea that people are basically good. They do a few bad things here and there, but they're basically good. What the Apostle Paul wants you to see, first and foremost, is that that is not true, that we're not basically good, that there's an intent in our hearts towards evil. Now, that that doesn't mean that we're as bad as we possibly could be, that every moment we do things that are completely sinful all the time in the worst possible way. If you think of the worst person you can think of, and a lot of people quote Hitler, and they just say, well, Hitler still had some, I mean, Hitler made a great freeway system. He helped the poor uh, by what he was doing with some of their economic policies. I'm sure he had love for Ava Brown, real love for her. So not everything the guy did was completely evil, but what it does mean is that 100% of our lives has been tainted by sin. It, it just, we, 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 have this, it, we have this thing in, in what we do. I don't know that I've ever had a, a exact, 100% pure motive in my entire life. So what this means is we need a Savior. We love a Savior. And, and, and if this is the only podcast you're going to hear, just know that the wrath of God has been absorbed by Jesus Christ on the cross, and that's the answer. Trust in him. So let me summarize for this week um, is that the gospel is good news, but, and I guess I should say, we're never going to understand the good news of the gospel with re, without really grasping the bad news. God is both simultaneously righteous, which means he's just, he's wrathful, he demands payment for sin, and, and he's merciful, loving, kind. And I know in our mind we can't get those two, but that's who he is. The Western mind is, and what we are living in, uh, here, if you're listening to me from America or Europe, uh, you, the, the, the idea here is that Jesus is not that way. He's just loving. He's my homeboy. You know, he, he's, he would never say anything like that. But the Bible, um, the Bible promotes both concepts of God, that he's just and loving and merciful. See, in the West, we come to the Bible and we come out there with the, with the idea, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? How can a God, loving God ever punish anyone? Actually, in the Bible, in the book of Romans, that, that's, the problem is actually flipped upside down. And it says, how can a righteous or a just God allow anyone into heaven? Do you see God that way? Do you see him as both just and as loving. Let me encourage you this week to just think of God in that category. I am really excited for the next three weeks with you all. 
These are actually life-changing, mind-transformational truths we're engaged right now. Thanks for listening. We will see you next week.